Okay, so a bit of context before the video begins. Now, if you follow my blog, you know that this is actually a three-part series. The first one was going to look at England and some far-flung places, the second one Wales and Northern Ireland, and the final one is Scotland. But because of school and other things, I hadn't been able to record the videos until today. And as of recording this, the Scottish elections are literally tomorrow. And while the Welsh elections are also happening tomorrow, this particular election isn't as instrumental to the Welsh independence movement as it is to the Scottish independence movement. So I wanted to get this out right before the election to give you an idea of the underlying motifs behind this election. And later on, I'll re-upload this without this starting segment, and also have some election analysis rather than just speculation, which I'll be doing later on in this video. And it'll also come after the first two UK parts rather than just coming out of nowhere. After a series of secession movements in the UK that we've discussed, we finally get to the biggest, the most significant, and the most influential one, Scotland. Basically the top half of the island of Britain, Scotland is a country within the United Kingdom that has about 5.4 million people. To the world is known as the place with funny accents, golf, haggis, bagpipes, kilts, and William Wallace. But what's perhaps slightly less known is that Scotland has already had a history with seeking independence. And I'm not talking about stuff like the 17th century, I'm talking about 2014. Now, some of you may have already seen it on the news, but 2014, Scotland had an independence referendum that saw 45% of voters wanting independence and 55% preferring to remain in the UK. Now, seven years later, Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon is seeking to hold another one. Throughout the video, I'll be comparing and contrasting the differences between these two movements, such as cause, public opinion, and the reaction of the UK. This video will also be split into three parts, before the elections, during the elections and before the referendum, and after independence, with the focus mainly placed on the first two as those are the two aspects that we have the most information about. First off, before the elections, i.e. where we are now. We can examine a lot of arguments again, but most of those have already been detailed in the Wales segment. In short, Scotland is more than capable of handling itself without the quote-unquote help of Westminster. Another common argument posed by right-wing unionists is SNP bad. They like to point to missteps that the SNP and the Scottish government have taken, such as the care home disaster earlier on in the pandemic, as well as excess amounts of drug deaths. Sturgeon has already made statements apologizing for these mistakes, an act that I don't think any politician in Westminster has done throughout the pandemic, and the Scottish Public Health Minister Joe Fitzpatrick actually resigned over the drug death incident, also a move not taken by a certain Home Secretary. However, as Davy McGuinness, a well-known independence activist on Facebook, points out, Scotland for some reason attributes all deaths due to drugs as drug deaths instead of direct death via intoxication or overdose. For example, if someone took drugs and killed a person in a car crash, that death would be counted towards the total as well. This system is not used in the rest of Europe or even the rest of the UK. And when one takes those indirect deaths out of the equation, the total is roughly similar to that of comparable European countries. These SMP skeptics also criticize Sturgeon and the SMP on matters that they do not have the power to control. For example, they like to ask why Margaret Ferrier has not been, and I quote, sacked. In case you didn't know, Margaret Ferrier was an SNP MP who was found to have taken a COVID test, traveled to London without knowing the results of the test, only to find out the test had come back positive, meaning she could have, and probably did, in fact, multiple people on her trips to and from London via public transport. These skeptics question why despite such behavior, she has not been sacked. The answer is that Sturgeon doesn't have the power to do so. She can advise Ferrier to resign, which Sturgeon did. However, as of recording this video, Ferrier has not done so. The most the SNP can do is suspend her from the party, which they have done, and she thus sits as an independent in the House of Commons, next to the likes of Jeremy Corbyn, which is the former Labour leader. Then they turn to meaningless empty accusations and negative adjectives. 
but then by insulting the party in power, surely is also insulting the electorate at the same time. If the SNP are so bad, then why do opinion polls say otherwise? And more importantly, why haven't they been voted out? If the SNP are as incompetent or inconsiderate as they claim, then surely a different party would have been voted in by now. But the SNP has had a considerable majority in Scotland for over a decade now, and this voting intentions poll indicate that all but one constituency in Scotland would be voting SNP, bar Edinburgh South, which would vote Labour. Personally, I find the poll to be a bit unreliable, seeing as Shetland and Orkney have always been a Lib Dem stronghold, but in this poll have swung to the SNP. Regardless, this new poll is notable too in that it has a massive sample size of 22,000 as opposed to the industry standard of 1,000 and change interviewees. Speaking of polls, James Kelly, a pro independence blog writer, has managed to procure the funds to commission a referendum voting intention poll through a fundraiser. Now, this was in January, and I wrote in my essay that I would not be surprised if this turned out to be the first poll showing support in the early 60s, which would really freak out unionists. However, obviously that did not happen. But let's check out the actual results. Now, normally he would commission panel base to do the survey, however, due to restrictions in funds and format, he had to commission surveyation, which tends to give more unionist results. And this poll in particular gave a 51-49 split when don't knows are taken out of the equation. Not the most resounding win yet, but still a win for the pro-independence movement nonetheless. At the time, this marked the 19th consecutive poll in favor of independence, as a previous one done in earlier January had shown a 57% support for independence. Also in the poll was a question on whether those supporting independence will support a plan B for achieving independence, which in this case refers to putting independence pledges in the manifestos of parties like the SNP or Scottish Greens, and aiming to achieve independence without a Section 30 order, which seems very unlikely at this time. And that question showed 55% support for this plan B. This may put pressure on the SNP to seek some sort of alternative non-Section 30 method to gain independence legally. The same surveillance poll also showed that, interestingly, there was a decrease in support for both the SNP and Scottish Tories in voting intentions, but somehow increased support for Scottish Labour. Though even more interestingly, this poll was done a day before Richard Leonard, leader of Labour in Scotland, resigned out of the blue. It will be interesting to see whether this resignation has any effect on the voting intentions. The current frontrunners for the new leader are Anna Sarwar, a pro-devolution but anti-referendum, I quote, not right now, politician, and Monica Lennon, a pro-referendum but anti-independence, i.e. democratic will of the Scottish people should not be blocked, politician, who was actually a person who brought up the free period products bill. Personally, I would support Lennon, as it would shake up Scottish Labour and perhaps make it more pro-referendum, if not pro-independence, but many have said that Labour are an irrelevance in Scotland, and I would tend to agree. And several months later, and we know that the winner is Anna Sarwar, aka the person on the left. Now, the elections. Polls predict that the SNP are again due for a massive majority, perhaps even winning over some Tory or Labour seats. Now, I would call an SNP win in Shetland and or Orkney a miracle, considering they couldn't even do that during the SNP landslide of 2011. By the way, Shetland and Orkney are some islands off the northwestern coast of mainland Scotland that are classified as Scottish territories. As mentioned earlier, they are the Scottish Lib Dems' heartlands, and I would be amazed if either of those were won over by the SNP. A while back, the Shetlandic Council voted almost unanimously to explore financial and political self-determination. This was misconstrued by right-wing newspapers to mean that Shetland wanted to break off from Scotland and become a crown territory, much like the current status of the Channel Islands, when the council actually meant devolution within Scotland. You know what the Crown Territories also are? Tax havens. Many affluent businessmen and politicians, mostly Tories, in the UK love to place their assets here to avoid paying taxes for them.
I've raised this point to a unionist before in a discussion on YouTube, and they said that this is somehow still better than the extra tax money going to the Scottish government or the SNP. Not sure how their reasoning works, but it's probably better than my understanding stays that way. Ultimately, the legal status of Shetland and Orkney could be negotiated after the elections. Now, say the SNP win a massive majority, as expected. Is that a mandate for a referendum? Absolutely, that's how Scotland got its first referendum. Now, some activists have accused the SNP of not using any of its mandates since 2014. It's a reasonable argument, but as Davy has said, Every movement has its moment, and perhaps the SNP feel that the strongest moment, basically guaranteeing a massive majority in favor of independence, is 2020 and 2021, where the difference of manner in which Westminster and Hollywood respectively deal with things like COVID and Brexit will highlight to the Scottish people that, you know, perhaps this whole UK thing isn't really working out. And for a while, the SNP were correct. From June last year to January this year, we saw a total of 20 consecutive polls in support of independence. However, after that, it started to dip, and right now it sits at roughly 50-50, barring the margin of error. And while I wrote in the blog post that there were two polls so far with 58% in support, one of them was later rechecked, and turns out it was only 55%. So there was no joint 58%. But ultimately, I think the largest hurdle preventing independence is the infighting within the Yes movement. Once in a while on Twitter, I see some bitter Yes voter accusing the SNP as well as Sturgeon of being docile and secretly being unionists. And while I haven't seen anyone say they went from Yes to No simply because of the SNP's inactivity, that could well be a possibility among a minority of the electorate. Some have even taught it that Scottish Greens as the better pro-independence party, which given its minuscule share of MSPs in Hollywood seems not the case. Davy has said that the SNP are the vehicle towards independence, while independent supporters are the driver. He also encourages them to stop fighting each other and focus on what's important. On the topic of independence or otherwise, the SNP is a perfect, but it's the best they've got. And recent events only seem to make my point even more. The setup of the Alipo party by Alex Salmon, while initially well-intentioned and aimed at gaining a maximum amount of pro-independence MSPs, has become a toxic cesspit where SNP and Alipo members hurl insults at each other. Even despite Salmon himself saying that he would vote SNP for the constituency vote, Many are still treating Alipa as a way to quote-unquote get back at the SNP and the Greens, who might form a coalition government in the next parliament. But then, how does mandate turn into referendum? While well, some SNP politicians, most notably MP Joanna Cherry, has mentioned looking into alternate methods of gaining independence. The traditional method, and the method used in 2014, was to get a Section 30 order from Westminster and the Prime Minister. And I'll explain what Section 30 means later. Some unionists have claimed that the Scottish government will never get a Section 30 order, so no independence for you. This has also been the line of Boris Johnson, who even just in January has said that referendums are not particularly jolly events, and said that a referendum by 2055 would be acceptable. 2055! I'm not sure that um, Boris's dad, or even himself, would live that long. And here comes another argument against the referendum. A line that ignorant unionists like to use being the phrase once in a generation. Some of them even made up a line called once in a lifetime. The first one has some credence, however it is not legally binding. In fact, in the Smith Agreement, signed in the aftermath of the 2014 referendum, states in Chapter 2 that it is agreed that nothing in this report prevents Scotland from becoming an independent country in the future, should the people of Scotland so choose. And have the people of Scotland chosen? It seems quite obvious. The phrase once in a generation vote was used as rhetoric to get people to vote, to get people to understand the importance of the vote. It was never stipulated that only once in a generation could a referendum be held. Plus, even if the phrase was legally binding, the Good Friday Agreement defines a political generation as seven years, 
And what's 2014 plus 7? You guessed it, 2021. Perhaps the government in Westminster should heed its own word. Though perhaps my favorite argument supporting holding a referendum supplied by an Irish political YouTuber Maximilian Robespierre is that surely if the union is as strong as some, like Jacob Rees-Mogg or Boris Johnson, like to claim, then wouldn't a referendum prove that to be the case? If the union is really not at the verge of tearing apart, then granting a referendum would show that the British government are not denying democracy and would display their viewpoint precisely. Don't give me anything about the hassle of hosting referendums during a pandemic. The USA, one of the biggest countries in the world, did a full-on election and has come out just fine. Everywhere around the world, elections are happening like normal, so Scotland with a relatively small electorate is going to handle this just fine. And the British government decided to go on with Brexit in the middle of the pandemic just when infection rates were highest in the country, so they have no authority to accuse the SNP of playing with lives. And finally, Sturgeon has said that she would like to host a referendum after the pandemic, but we'll get onto that later. Even unionists like Phil from a different bias acknowledge that the future of Scotland should be for the people of Scotland to decide, not Westminster. However, I have a growing suspicion that Boris Johnson and co. actually want Scotland to go independent and are angering the Scots on purpose to be the bad guy and deny a Section 30 order and rile them up to make them want to leave this union due to a perceived undemocraticness. Why? Because they erroneously think that Westminster funds Scotland, a stance held by many right-wing unionists and certainly Brexiteers. In their point of view, London would save a huge amount of money if they could just quote-unquote stop funding Scotland. That's why I've seen certain people on political Twitter, despite being English and right-wing, actually support Scotland leaving the Union. Not with a stance of, I'm sorry you had to leave, but I can't blame you guys, but rather good riddance. Another reason many Tories will secretly support Scottish independence is because the SNP are the second largest opposition party in Westminster behind Labour. Though many in Scotland refer to Labour as the Red Tories, but I digress. Removing the SNP from the House of Commons would give the Tory party an even bigger majority than they already have, thus further minimizing a chance for Labour to vote down a bill that the Tories want to pass. Back to the referendum. Like I mentioned before, Joanna Cherry has openly supported seeking alternate methods towards a referendum and independence. For example, alternate legal routes through the 1998 Scotland Act. Phil predicts that the Scotland Act will be tested multiple times this year, and he is correct. In fact, an independence activist named Martin Keatings has taken the case to court, specifically the Court of Session, which is basically Scotland's Supreme Court. However, the case was deemed premature and theoretical, and to be fair, that was the case. It was before the SNP, or more precisely, Mike Russell, announced an 11-part plan for achieving a referendum. Keatings then said that he would resume the case in the inner chamber of the Court of Session. Late last month, a court rejected Keatings' attempt to appeal the case. Not sure where we go from here, but that's that. Davy has expressed his disapproval of the Scotland Act, saying it was created by Labour to screw over Scotland. Regardless, Michael or Mike Russell, the SNP president and Constitution Secretary, has said that they wouldn't just seek a plan B, i.e. an alternate route towards independence, they would seek all plans A to Z. Certainly encouraging, but whether that amounts to anything legally is yet to be seen. Douglas Ross, the leader of the Scottish Tories in Westminster, has said that his party would boycott any referendum, even one proven to be constitutional by the court. Typical of them, but still saddening. Many independence activists have in turn argued that even if the Tories boycott the referendum, as long as the voting data shows that more than 50% of the electorate voted in favor of independence, the result is clear nonetheless. The boycott would not have made a difference. There is also the question of whether a simple majority of above 50% is considered a win, or whether it would need to be higher than that. I can see the Tories using this as a bargaining chip while negotiating to host a referendum. There's also a third route to a referendum, and that's not to have a referendum at all, but rather a plebiscite. 
What's a plebiscite? It's basically having the election and the referendum at the same time. To vote for a desired party as well as your stance on independence on the same piece of ballot paper, or essentially a one-issue election, where parties campaign to voters on that issue and that issue alone. Some activists have been campaigning for a plebiscite, however, as I said earlier, Mike Russell released an 11-point plan from the May vote to the referendum, so it seems quite clear that a plebiscite is off the cards. It might disappoint some, but the SMP are the ones in power. Finally, how should the question be phrased? Some hardcore unionists have claimed that the question back in 2014 was biased and rigged towards independence. I'm not quite sure where it comes from since they won their cause with that question. Obviously, the clearest and simplest way to do it will be to use a 2014 question verbatim, i.e. should Scotland be an independent country, with two choices, yes or no. No such thing as don't know, the reason it's included in polls is because it served to reflect the amount of people on the fence hesitating whether to vote for or against independence. And unionists would argue that Scots in other parts of the UK should be allowed to vote in the referendum in an attempt to rig the vote in their favour because Scots and Wales or England tend to be overall more unionist than those in Scotland, see Michael Gove. But this makes no sense. During the Brexit referendum, were Britons living in other EU countries allowed to vote? No, they were not. So. It seems almost fanatical that Scots not living in Scotland should be allowed to vote. After all, it's a vote for the people living in Scotland, not a vote for people born in Scotland and living elsewhere. It affects the people living in Scotland and is by and large irrelevant to Scots who weren't planning to live in Scotland anyway. Perhaps it's just my wishful thinking, but I suspect that Boris Johnson will do what he did with the Brexit deal. Talk with a lot of big and firm words, make meaningless threats, repeat the same rhetoric hundreds of times, but at the last second, which I presume here will be the SNP winning a majority and unpopularity even amongst his own party, he would grant the almighty, omnipotent Section 30 order. And what is a section 30 order anyway? It's not permission for a referendum that was never restricted by section 30. It's an order that basically grants the Scottish Parliament powers over the constitution, which would normally be a reserved power. In the UK, referenda are by definition non-binding, so unlike what some Tories may suggest, there is no such thing as an illegal or wildcat referendum. It's only if the government decides to act on the referendum results that the results themselves become official. And so we go to the polls. Now, we get to the results, there are obviously going to be two scenarios, either yes wins or no wins. In the very unlikely scenario of an absolute tie, I think some sort of recounts would occur, but there's such a low chance of that happening that I don't see it worthy of discussion. Now, within a Section 30 order, would the major unionist parties still accept the result? Obviously, it depends on the choice that came out on top. If it's a win for no, then all is well, at least with the unionist parties. Whereas if that winning vote goes towards yes, and I highly suspect it will, then we could have some trouble. However, were the referendum to be proven constitutional by the Court of Session or Supreme Court, the rejection of Indy Ref 2's legitimacy could be tough and cause further division within the different unionist parties than there already is, especially the Labour Party. In fact, according to a recent poll, literally from mid last month, more than 60% of Labour members UK-wide actually support having a second referendum, contrary to the stances of the Scottish and UK Labour leaders. That said, however, the Welsh Labour leader and current Welsh First Minister Mark Drakeford has made it clear that he thinks a second referendum is definitely acceptable if the electorate vote for a party going on that mandate. And for people not versed in British politics, IndyRef2 is the short form for Independence Referendum 2. Say that one way or another, all groups to different degrees of willingness accept the results. If the vote ends with no winning, then we'll effectively see a repeat of 2014. But if the vote ends with yes taking the lead, then obviously negotiations on Scotland becoming independent will have to ensue, and they will have to make sure that the division of assets between the two parties are as fair as can be. 
Issues like the currency, borders, and such should probably be set out by the SNP before the referendum, but it's not impossible that the Tories decide to give Scotland a Section 30 order on the basis that they set some conditions that the SNP have campaigned against, such as a hard border between Scotland and England, Scotland paying its quote-unquote share of debt when in reality Scotland has no borrowing powers, or an independent Scotland having to use a specific currency decided by the Tories, meaning a limited fiscal freedom. Though if we go by the SNP line back in 2014, an independent Scotland would seek to have no hard border with England and continue to use the sterling, which I must remind you is controlled by the Bank of England and not Westminster. And indeed, one major factor that analysts contributed to the yes loss in 2014 was that many questions were left unanswered. Things like EU accession, because the UK had said it would veto Scottish accession to the EU, exact details of assets divisions, and other things. And just last month, responding to the threat that RBS, a bank operating in Scotland, would move out completely from an independent Scotland, Sturgeon also mentions that her currency plans for an independent Scotland would be to follow in the footsteps of Ireland. In the early days, continue to use sterling, and then eventually set up a central bank and such things within a transition period towards a new currency. And with respect to borders, the SNP have made clear they want to retain the Common Travel Area, or CTA, that currently exists between the UK and Ireland. Even if an independent Scotland joins the EU, which it will, let's face it, the CTA means that people can move freely within these isles, and it's only goods that will be checked between the England-Scotland border. All this, though, assumes that England and Wales will never rejoin the EU Single Market and Customs Union, which, given the dire circumstances fishermen in Kent and Cornwall find themselves in, seems very unlikely. If England and Wales do rejoin the single market, then movement across the borders will almost be as seamless as it had been when Scotland was part of the UK. No, there's still the issue of nuclear bombs to deal with. Yes, the UK currently has nuclear capabilities in the form of four ballistic missile submarines belonging to the Royal Navy, respectively named HMS Vanguard, Victorious, Vigilant, and Vengeance. These submarines are stored at the naval base of Clyde in Scotland, and Trident, as the program is referred to, is something that the SNP, as well as the general Scottish population, are not particularly fond of. In fact, the SNP have said that denuclearization is one of their main goals in an independent Scotland. So where would these nukes go? Well, a few spots have been considered within the rest of the UK, but all deemed unsuitable in some way one of which was in Wales, much to the chagrin of Plaid Cymru. There were even proposals to station these submarines in France or even the US, but at this stage, nothing is confirmed about that just yet. The prospect of the UK having to place their nuclear submarines in a foreign country would obviously undermine their nuclear capabilities, which is why, of all countries, Russia and Iran supported the YES campaign back in 2014. And recently, the UK government released a defense report that pledged to increase the number of nuclear warheads from 195 to 260. On the exact same day, the UN Charter for the Right of the Child was integrated into Scots law, agreed unanimously by the Scottish Parliament. You know, really puts the phrase bairns not bombs into context. What would happen to the name of the UK? Right now, it's obviously the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, but Great Britain is what we know today as England, Scotland, and Wales. One source claims that Britain is just England and Wales, but most other reliable sources also include Scotland in said definition. And geographically, that is correct. The island of Britain consists of all three nations. I would guess that the source that does not include Scotland would have used the archaic definition of England being Britain, as Wales was not established as separate to England until much later on after the Treaty of Union in 1707. So maybe they could use the name United Kingdom of England, Wales, and Northern Ireland instead, but that's really long and clumsy, as is their current name. What would happen to the flag? 
As we know, the blue parts in the Union Jack are contributed by the Scottish Saltire. Would the blue portion just get removed, leaving you with white and red on the flag? And would this change affect the other sovereign nations with Union Jacks in their flags, like Fiji or New Zealand? To me, an ideal way out would be to have a change on the official UK flag as well as the overseas territories flags which have Union Jacks in them, while keeping the blue in flags of the Fiji and other New Zealand one, because it hints at their history that the country was formed when Scotland was still part of the Union. Personally, when it comes to the flag issue, I think representation for Wales is long overdue. I found multiple flag designs made back in 2014 in the event of the yes vote winning. The flag that particularly caught my eye was this one, on the right, with the top half still just red and white while the bottom half is joined by some green, mimicking the colour scheme of the Welsh flag. It's a shame that the dragon couldn't be represented, but it would be fair to say that drawing it in addition to the Union Jack would be a great hassle. Plus, I think that the Welsh flag dragon is an absolute treasure and deserves to stay in Wales and the Welsh flag where it belongs. I started writing the essay on the 4th of January, but on the day after that, news was received that Margaret Ferrier, the COVID rule breaching MP that I mentioned earlier on, was arrested by the Scottish police for breaching even more COVID rules and restrictions. Make of that what you will, but I would question why Dominic Cummings is still free of any charges despite that trip during lockdown to quote-unquote get an eyesight check. Sure, Ferrier may have breached more rules, but it's more a question of did they do it and not how much they have done it. Sturgeon also got major praise from notable figures for having taken the decisive action to enact a national lockdown as well as closing schools until February, which was only followed by Boris Johnson doing his own lockdown several hours later. This decisiveness, as well as the British public seeing that Boris Johnson is lagging behind not just Starmer but Sturgeon on pandemic measures, could push the tide further towards independence. Regardless, once all is said and done, Scotland is welcomed by the United Nations as its newest member, assuming the UK doesn't veto it. Would this cause a chain reaction in the UK, leading to Irish reunification and or Welsh independence? The latter certainly seems more likely in this scenario, given that Scotland and Wales have a more similar constitutional status compared to that of Northern Ireland. And in fact, in a 2016 poll held by YouGov, it was found that support for independence jumped from 19% to 24% if Scotland had gone independent. Indeed, the Welsh First Minister, Mark Drakeford, has also said much more recently that if Scotland decides to take its own path, we will have to rethink about our relationship with England and will need to consider the arrangements and the options. Not quite a resounding endorsement of the Union, but suspiciously vague on the constitutional future of Wales. I've said it before and I'll say it again. When a devolution situation in Wales becomes unbearable, Welsh Labour will inevitably diverge and perhaps even split from British Labour, unless Plaid Cymru comes into power like the SNP. In Northern Ireland, I imagine we'll just kind of proceed on its own schedule, though a successful and complete Scottish independence will undoubtedly increase calls for a border poll. The next two topics of some debate are the monarchy and the EU. Given that Kate and William recently made a train trip to Scotland despite Sturgeon's advice, plus the royal assent, i.e. from the Queen, given to the devolution trashing internal market bill, I can't imagine the royals being particularly popular in Scotland. The official SNP stance is to keep them in, however it seems imperative that a referendum on this issue should be held to find out the actual stance of the general public. As of the 9th of April 2021, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, and the husband of Queen Elizabeth has passed away. Obviously, condolences to all involved, but I think this more than anything has boosted the Republican movement, both in Scotland and elsewhere in the UK. And a lot of that has to do with the media. For an entire two days straight, the BBC suspended all forms of broadcasting on their various channels, opting only to talk about Prince Philip and his history. Most other major TV channels did the same, with the exception of Channel 4. After a while, the complaints section of the BBC website got so congested that they had to set up a new exclusive page for complaints pertaining to Prince Philip coverage. I actually sent in a complaint just for fun. They haven't quote-unquote gone back to me yet, as they said they would. 
Later on, figures would show that there were over a hundred thousand complaints due to people dissatisfied with the lack of coverage of other news, such as David Cameron's corruption accusations and the riots in Northern Ireland. And why I say that this would boost the Republican movement is that in this day and age, many people would find this wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the death of one person excessive and unneeded, and might think that it would just be better if the monarchy was done away with. With regards to action for the parliaments, Westminster, Holyrood, and the Senate were all recalled for party leaders to give condolences to the passing of the Duke of Edinburgh, most notably, in my view, Patrick Harvey, co-leader of the Scottish Greens, implied that he wasn't a big fan of the monarchy but still paid respect as he would any other 99-year-old man who passed away. Twitter's reactions were mixed, but as I've learned over these past few months of scrolling political Twitter, never treat Twitter as a reflection of society. Back to the topic though, it seems like quite a no-brainer to have a referendum on EU accession. Obviously, Scotland voted 62% to remain in the EU. Being pulled out of the EU against its will is of course something that has contributed to its calls for independence. I have little doubt that the Scottish public would vote to rejoin, perhaps seeing the omni shambles that have been created as a result of Brexit by an even greater margin than in 2016. And as of April 2021, Nicola Sturgeon has said that there would not be a referendum on rejoining the EU after independence. Taking the statement at face value, it would seem like Sturgeon suddenly became this avid Eurosceptic. But dig deeper and you'll see that the truth is Sturgeon is so confident that the people of Scotland won back in the EU so much that not even a confirmatory referendum would be required. Now we assume that the public have voted in favour of rejoining the EU. Some unionists like to pull out Spain as their kind of trump card and say that Spain would veto its accession because Catalonia blah blah blah. However, in 2012, a Spanish official actually said the exact opposite. He said that as long as the referendum is certified to be legal, constitutional, and agreed by all parties involved, Spain has no place to veto an independent Scotland rejoining the EU. In fact, some EU officials have even hinted at fast-tracking Scotland's re-entry, seeing as Scotland is close friends with many of the big and influential EU countries, certainly Germany and most definitely France, and returning to the EU would not be a brand new process, but just a return to the status quo, or perhaps even greater integration such as joining the Schengen Zone. And on the topic of Catalonia, it must be noted that Scotland cannot be lumped into the same category as Catalonia or other secessionist movements in Europe. In fact, you can't really call Scottish independence as a secessionist event at all because Scotland is a country, according to British constitutional documents, mind you, and Scottish independence is the leaving of a country from a union, i.e. the United Kingdom. Some have referred to the movement as Skexit, which I think sounds ugly and I'd much rather be called just Scottish independence or the Yes movement. But if we compare Scotland and Catalonia, you'll see that the largest difference yet comes from their constitutional status. Catalonia is a province, Scotland is a country. The Spanish constitution clearly states that the territory of Spain is indivisible, whereas the British constitution, or what we refer to as the British constitution, has no such equivalent clause. Scotland is not Catalonia, hence why Spain will have little to say with regards to Scotland breaking off from the UK and then joining the EU, so long as the breakup is constitutional, of course, proven as such either through a hypothetical section 30 order or a court ruling. Some skeptics have said that the EU allowing Scotland to rejoin would boost secessionist movements within EU countries, like Catalonia, Galicia, Brittany, Bavaria, Flanders, Corsica, Basque Country, etc. But in my view, it's the exact opposite occurring. It's more a case of this is what happens when you leave the EU without unanimous consent from all communities. Similarly, Brexit has, contrary to what certain Brexiteers have claimed, actually diminished the Eurosceptic voices throughout EU countries, say in Italy or Greece. After seeing a car crash that was Brexit, and how well the EU did out of the deal, these groups would understand that perhaps it's better off to stay in the European Union, or at least stay quiet about their Euroscepticism, seeing as the general public isn't quite in line with that viewpoint. Many like to criticize the EU, and I do understand its flaws, however, it's a unifying power that encourages integration and tries to suppress the xenophobia and blind nationalism that Brexiteers tend to have. 
It's not perfect, but it's the best we've got. Of course, internal enlargement of the UU is a much debated topic, and I do wish to return to it at a later date. Back to Scotland. Would Scotland use the euro? Richard Murphy, an experienced economics expert, argues against it. He claims that it will prevent Scotland from being, quote, truly independent, but obviously this is a decision for the people of Scotland to make. If we simply go by historical precedent, the answer is simple. Just look next door to the Republic of Ireland. They're quite happy to use the euro, and it's not down to one economist to determine what independence and sovereignty means anyway. Personally, I take no real stance on this, but joining the euro would make sense. A transition period would obviously have to be implemented for citizens to change all their pounds into euros, perhaps over a course of five years. Regardless, Scotland would have to set up its own central bank for the interim period between independence and EU accession to print its own pounds and store them. This has yet to be addressed by the Scottish government, but I have confidence that they will do so in the near future. And more recent opinions from Davy and Phil raise some important points. First from Davy, it's not hard to create a currency. Unionists like to claim it's just impossible task, yet upon the breakup of Czechoslovakia, new currencies as well as respective central banks were created in three months, so the SNP technically has no reason to address it at this stage, though 2014 would probably advise otherwise. Phil, from a different bias on the other hand, while making a point unrelated to Scottish independence, notes that there are countries that have joined the EU for a decade now and have still not adopted the euro. Yes, technically it's mandatory for new members, but the EU allows countries to go at their own pace and create their own transition period for adopting the euro. As such, some countries like Croatia and Bulgaria have been in the EU for many years now and still have not joined the eurozone. Scotland could just do the same and use its own currency indefinitely. And what role would an independent Scotland take in the European Union? Well, it seems quite obvious, a leader of combating climate change. Scotland has always been touted to be at the front line of cutting-edge climate change action. In fact, the geography of Scotland means that it has 25% of the total capacity of wind and tidal power, as well as 10% of the EU's wave power capacity potential. North Sea oil is also still abundant, with Scotland joining Wales and exporting energy to England. However, while North Sea oil was used in the 2014 campaign as a means to, quote, take back control, its recent push towards renewable energy means that such a bargaining chip is no longer viable. It could certainly be a revenue stream, however, it would impede on the Scottish government's efforts to cut down on fossil fuels. As of late, the Scottish government has been looking into electricity generation via hydrogen fuels. COP26, or the United Nations Climate Change Conference, is due to be held in Glasgow this year. I could see this as an opportunity to show the world that Scotland is different from the rest of the UK in terms of climate change action, and a way to raise awareness in the global community that Scottish independence is happening right here, right now, and that any help in this campaign can mean a further push towards a greener world. Scotland is also unique compared to the other UK countries in that it is more likely to go for progressive policies, like making period products free of charge to combat period poverty, which saw Scotland explode on social media and the global scene more generally with discussion rife about this groundbreaking and first-in-the-world move. To end off the story, I'd like to quote an article that compared the current relationship between England and Scotland with Czechoslovakia. A similar situation was occurring in Czechoslovakia, where one side felt underrepresented while the other felt it was having a net loss by funding the other portion. So in 1993, even without a majority calling for it, Czechoslovakia split into the Czech Republic and Slovakia. And almost 20 years on, and they are still closest brothers, joined at the hip. Yet there is no more bitterness, no more imaginary lines being drawn for nationalism. Both are now members of the EU and have both prospered greatly of their respective merit. Geoffrey Chapman, who is the advisor for the UK government's Department for International Trade, notes in an article that just like the Czech Republic and Slovakia reduced trade with each other and increased trade with Germany, Scotland and England could do the same, opting to trade more with the EU. The 300-year-old union between England and Scotland has been time and again hailed as one of the strongest and most enduring unions. But as the world moves into the modern age, perhaps for better or worse, it is time to accept that the days of empire are long gone. 
For some extra information, as you may or may not know, a row erupted between Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmon, as well as the civil service. The British media was all over it, and that hurt the SNP and independents in the polls for a bit. However, Sturgeon was clear of breaking the ministerial code by an independent inquiry by James Hamilton QC, and while independent support now sits at roughly 50-50, in the words of polling analyst James Kelly, the detrimental effect has now likely bottomed out. Ironically, the very same surveillance poll that showed that 49% support for independence also gave the SNP an incredible majority of 67 seats, as well as the Tories dropping to become the third largest party in Hollywood. So if this is the baseline, just imagine what could happen next. And I imagine that the horrifying drop of salmon exports to the EU by 98% will also play a huge part in the argument for Scottish independence as well. Obviously, the plurality of Scots didn't vote for Brexit, and in the aforementioned Servation poll, 53% of respondents said they would vote for independence if it also meant joining the EU, which the SNP planned to do. Also, despite the salmon saga, Sturgeon's popularity hasn't really taken much of a hit at all and the general public, at least according to polls, are still highly approving of her government's handling of vaccinations and the pandemic more generally. And in the last month, it was revealed that Scotland generated enough electricity from renewables that 97% of all households could be powered off renewables alone in 2020. It was also announced by the Scottish government that they plan to give NHS staff a 4% pay rise, contrary to the 1% that the UK government announced. Though for some reason, specifically doctors are left out of the pay rise. Not sure why that's the case, but monetary recuperation from medical staff during these trying times is always welcome. A draft of the independence referendum bill has also been published, which is to be passed in the early session of Parliament in May. It sets out the question to be asked in the referendum, which is the same as the 2014 one. Should Scotland be an independent country? Instead of the Remain Leave question that someone suggested. In fact, a poll was commissioned by Scotland and Union using the latter question, and it gave an unusually low support for independence. While it's essentially asking the same thing, such a roundabout way of asking it means that certain respondents are likely to confuse it for the Brexit question. Back to the bill, which sets out the semi-vague timescale for holding the referendum. Some independence activists have said that this might result in a referendum at the end of the year. However, most betting sites and political pundits are saying that 2022 is most likely. Nicola Sturgeon has more recently said in both interviews and leader debates that she wants to hold a referendum after the pandemic, before 2023 and during the COVID recovery, so make of that what you will. Alipa Party supporters are going to be disappointed though for sure, because Alex Salmon has repeatedly urged the SNP government to be more proactive in getting the referendum and the negotiations done. Oh, and on another positive note, some sources are claiming that Iceland will accept a pro-yes majority as independence, whether the referendum is recognized by Westminster or not, and will recognize Scotland as an independent country. I couldn't find a reliable source for that, but if it's true, then, you know, that's great. And also, Scotland has opened an office in Denmark, likely to become their first embassy, I imagine. This goes to show that Scotland is trying to strengthen its ties to the Nordic countries, and I fully expect it to join the Nordic Council once independent. And a while ago, Mary Black MP made an excellent speech on why Scotland has the right to have a second referendum, and some have even said that she is deserving of the post of the next First Minister, or even Prime Minister, who knows. And I'll link the speech in the description so you can watch it for yourself. Regardless, things are looking up again, but the independence community must still be vigilant of the anti-SNP mainstream media. So that's the end of my scripted video, and as I record this, it is 5.53 a.m. in Hong Kong, and don't ask why I'm doing this in the morning. Um, but because of time zones, Scotland is uh, seven hours behind of Hong Kong, which means they are less than two hours away from reaching the 6th of May. Um, so I thought we'd look at a few final polls right before the election, which in the business they call exit polls. And I like to start off with this YouGov one because it pretty much represents the best case scenario for uh, independence, I think. Obviously, we have the constituency vote <clears throat> with the SNP doing really good on 52%. And on this vote, it's also amazing because look at the green vote, 13%. That is a all, that's an, that's an all-time high. 
like three percent below labor, and even Alpa are on three percent, which means they could possibly take one or two seats. Uh, uh, one of them possibly just being Alex Salmon himself, um, and that's what some other um, projections have given us. Not this particular one by uh, Ballot Box Scotland, which gave uh, which gave Alpa no seats. However, um, some other projections made by Sir John Curtis from the University of Strathclyde um, gave Alpa, I think, one or two seats. And if you look at this map, it's just glorious. Like, come on, <laughs> seventy seats. Almost all of mainland Scotland is just painted yellow, um, except for that one little bit. Of Tory near the borders, and obviously Orkney and Shetland are Lib Dem strongholds as usual. But if you look at the regional vote, you see that um, the Greens are on 12 seats, and that's just incredible. That's I think that's double their current um, their current MSP count, or maybe even more than that. So that's the YouGov poll, and here's the thing, right? Uh, if you look at YouGov in 2016, they got the result really close to the final result, um, as, especially on the list where they predicted SMP would take 41, and SMP actually took 41.7, and overall it just got really close to the final result. So if this is what we're expecting, then oh my god. Seriously, that would be amazing. But let's look at some other polls. Now, here we see three other polls uh, released by Ipsos Mori, Servation, and Savannah Congress, respectively. Um, you know, their own respective exit polls, if you will. And you can see that the, the Savannah Congress poll is clearly an outlier, putting the SMP on just 58, which is frankly terrible. That's worse than their current uh, incumbent government. Um, and Ipsos Mori and Servation both put their um, projection of SMP seats at roughly just a few points above, um, a few seats above the overall majority threshold, which is actually 65. Um, and that's what I think will be the most likely scenario. Um, Though, of course, I'm going to pray for the YouGov scenario to come true as well, because that would just be incredible. And that would be the biggest mandate ever, even bigger than the one in uh, 2011 for independence. But yeah. All right, so I was just scrolling my Twitter timeline, and because I follow the National, I saw this new story about Boris Johnson being asked about... Um, Scotland, and in particular in the Ref 2. So he was asked whether uh, he would agree to this vote, and he, instead of saying, um, you know, no vote until 2055 or whatever, he actually said, well, let's wait and see what actually happens. Um, I think this shows a marked change in stance, you know, instead of just indefinitely denying it forever. Um, he's thinking that it might change depending on the circumstances. So I think it's Boris Johnson realizing that he can't uh, deny democracy forever. And if the SNP uh, get a majority, or at least there's a pro-independence majority in the next parliament, which I think is very, 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 very likely, at least the pro-independence part, um, he's realizing Boris Johnson is realizing that he can't deny democracy forever. And I think this could be very interesting for, or to signal things to come. But yeah, um, let's see what happens next, I guess. Regardless, next time on the show, though it may take a little while to get finished, a group of violence that are getting a little rebellious. Hope you enjoyed, like and subscribe, and I'll see you later.